ASP.NET Core from Microsoft is one of the most popular web frameworks. Experienced developer Brugin Patel will teach you how to use .NET 6, which is the latest version. Hi guys and welcome to .NET Mastery. My name is Brugin and in this course we will walk through the basic foundations of .NET Core application. We will be using .NET 6 in this course along with Visual Studio 2022. .NET Core has been a buzzword in the industry for a while, and recently it has been gaining more and more attention because of the efficiency and the advantages that it brings. So first, let's take a look at what are all the exciting topics that we will cover in this course. Foundation is a basic element of any building, and that will be the first thing that we will learn as we explore the fundamentals of .NET Core and its evolution. Then it's critical to understand what is new in .NET 6 when it comes to an MVC application. So I will highlight the new features in .NET 6 with respect to the MVC application. We will be using Entity Framework Core to set up database, connection string, and perform all the database-related operation. Once we have Entity Framework Core configured, we will be performing CRUD operations on any model. CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete. So while we perform the CRUD operations, we will also understand how client-side and server-side validations work with .NET Core. We will display nice alerts using temp data and toaster.js. Now while we learn all of this, one critical piece is error solving when it comes to any programming. I will display you some of the common errors and how will you approach those errors and resolve them? Lastly, we will deploy our application to Azure and we will see everything live, including SQL Server, which will be hosted on Azure as well. So you can see there is quite a few things that we will be learning in this course. Let's get started with all of that from the next video. In this video, let me show you the demo application that we will be building. We will start with an empty project and then we will use Bootswatch theme to add a nice styling. Next, we will be building a category CRUD project. So when you click on category in the navigation bar, it will open up the page and it will display all the categories. First thing that you notice here is we have a create category button. When we click there, it takes us to category create and here without populating anything if you press the create button we have default client side validation not just that we also have some server side validation like if we enter both name and display order to be same and hit the create button we have a server side validation that display order cannot exactly match the name then we have a back to list button here to go back to our index page with the category list. We can edit any of the existing category and as soon as you edit or create something, we have nice toaster alerts that you can see. Lastly, we will implement the delete functionality and on that also, we will have our alerts. So we will see server side, client side validation, we will implement toaster alerts and take a look at temp data. Not only that, once we complete the application, we will be deploying that to Azure. So that will give you a complete flow of the application as we deploy things to Azure along with our database. So with that, let's start on this from the next video. Let's take a look at all the tools that we will use in this course. We will be using .NET 6 for our application. So make sure to install the latest version of .NET 6. For the IDE, we will be using Visual Studio. The version that I will be using is Visual Studio 2022. There are lots of advanced features in 2022 as compared to 2019. So you can always install the free version of Visual Studio 2022. For our database, we will be using SQL Server. So first you will have to install SQL Server and then you should install SSMS which is SQL Server Management Studio. 
If you have older version of SSMS, that's completely okay. As long as you are able to connect to SQL Server on your local machine, we will be using that connection string and everything will work. So once you install all three of these softwares, let's continue from the next video. In this video, I want to walk you through the journey of .NET Core. .NET Core is probably the biggest change that the .NET language has encountered. In 2002, Microsoft introduced Web Forms, which was a revolution at that time. Web Forms has its drawbacks and there was a need to overcome all of them. Because of that, the .NET team came up with a new architecture, which was .NET MVC. Now, even though I love MVC and I have built many applications in MVC, it had its flaws, like it was created on top of the components for web forms. Because of that, it was tied to IIS and ultimately Windows operating system. But with the evolution of web development, Microsoft had to keep up with the changing technology. Finally, in June of 2016, Microsoft released ASP.NET Core and it was the first version. Now, .NET Core is built on top of the new .NET Core framework. It is completely rewritten and it is a cross-platform version, hence it is not tied with Windows. Also, .NET Core was built with cloud in mind, so it is extremely robust with that. Then, in August of 2018, Microsoft released .NET Core 2 and the team has been active with releasing new versions. There was a big change from .NET 2.1 to 2.2 because we had to update quite a few class libraries and there were few challenges. But since then, .NET Core team has been releasing new versions with 3, 3.1 and .NET 5, which was released in November of 2020. After that, there is .NET 6, which will be released in November of 2021. We will be using the preview version, but whatever we learn will be the same once .NET 6 is released. So this is a small overview of all the .NET frameworks and their evolution. That being said, why should one use .NET Core as compared to the classic .NET? .NET Core comes with many advantages. First one is ASP.NET Core is fast and open source. If you compare that to the traditional .NET applications, there have been quite a few benchmarks and it is very fast when you compare that to web forms or even .NET MVC. .NET Core is also cross-platform. The classic .NET was tied to IIS and Windows, but since the .NET Core is rewritten, it has removed that dependency with .NET Core. We also have a built-in support for dependency injection, which saves a lot of time and it is extremely helpful. Once you get used with using dependency injection, you cannot imagine your application without that. With any programming language, it is critical that the new updates or the new version that are released, they should be easily upgradable. And that is one of the feature with .NET Core. When a new version is released, updating to that new version does not have groundbreaking changes. Because of that, you can always keep up with the new versions. .NET Core is also cloud-friendly. When the .NET Core was being written, cloud architecture was kept in mind and because of that it is completely compatible with all of the cloud components. And lastly, when it comes to performance, .NET Core exceeds all of the previous versions and even the new versions in .NET Core that are being released, they supersede the previous version. The code actually gets more optimized that results into improved performance. The ASP.NET Core compiler will eventually optimize the entire code whenever the code is recomposed using the .NET Core framework. .NET Core's actual performance is multiple times than any of the framework's previous implementation. Because of that, it is clear that Microsoft has a long-term plan with .NET Core technology. So with that brief overview, 
Let's continue our learning in the next video. In this video, before we take a look at the other files, I will introduce you to a new concept which is dependency injection. ASP.NET Core implements a simple built-in dependency injection. Container dependency injection is an integral part of the ASP.NET Core architecture. .NET Core injects objects of dependency classes through constructor by using the built-in IOC container. Before I show you what advantages dependency injection brings, let's see a scenario where there is no dependency injection. In a typical application, let's say we have three pages right now and we have some common functionality that we want to use across all the three pages. Like let's say we want to send emails and we want to access our database in all the three pages that we have. Now let's imagine that on these three pages we need to access the database first. So what we will do is we will create the object for database classes on all the three pages. We will have to open that connection. We will have to do the database operation and then we will have to close the connection in all the places. To do the same and create object for email implementation that we have in all the three pages. So you can see this is lot of duplicate code. On top of that, what happens in future if you change the implementation of how you access the database or email? Based on the current configuration, you might have to make that change in all of the three pages, which is a big mess because right now it's three pages. Down the line, it could be 30 or 300 pages. Another issue here is that on each page, you will deal with creating the object, managing them, as well as disposing them. And that will be a time-consuming effort when we have to do that in all the pages. So that being said, what is a solution to avoid all of this and get an optimal architecture? The answer to all of that is dependency injection. First, let me show how this scenario would look like. Again, we will have the three pages and we will have email and database functionality. These are the common things that we had before as well. But now we will have something special, which is dependency injection container. So as you can see, we have got our dependency injection container that will have an iEmail and an IDB interface and its implementation. So inside our container, we have the implementation of the iEmail interface and the IDB interface. When any page will need access to these functionalities, it will just ask the dependency injection container to create an object of this functionality and directly give page an object to use. So inside the page, we will actually be using an interface and then dependency injection does all its magic of passing the object when the website needs it. That way, we do not have to deal with creating the object, disposing or managing that object inside our pages. Our pages will look very clean with just the interface. All the instance and implementation will be done by dependency injection container. Now in future, if you want to change or replace the email class, you do not have to make any changes in the pages. All you have to do is just change the implementation inside the email class. And since we are registering that in the container, next time when we build the project, it will take the new implementation. So you can see we only have to change in one place now. That is one of the main advantage that comes with dependency injection. Now, in order to use dependency injection, you can use many third-party tools. But with .NET Core, we have a built-in dependency injection container and that has its own advantages. So I hope with that, you have a short overview of how dependency injection is helpful. First thing that we have to do is we need to create our project. I will be using Visual Studio 2022. Here we have the recent projects on the left and on the right hand side, we will get started. We want to start by creating a new project. So we will click that 
and it will display all of the templates. You can either navigate and try to find the template or you can just search here for model, views and controller. As soon as you type that, you see there are two templates that are available right here. We will be using the ASP.NET Core with c -sharp language. We do not want the other language. So select the c -sharp language or ASP.NET Core web app and we have model, views and controller. Let's hit the next button and we have few more options that we have to configure. Before writing the project name, we can give our solution a meaningful name. So let's say we are making our project for bulky book and in that you can have multiple projects. Like there can be data access layer, that can be business layer, that can be web layer and so on. So solution name, we can keep that as bulky book and then the project name, let's call this bulky book web. That way you can keep the project name and the solution name separated. Let me change the location to where I want to save on my computer and we will hit the next button. Final thing that we have to select here is the framework version. We will be using .NET 6 so we will select that in the first option. Next we have authentication type. When you click the authentication drop down there are individual users account, Microsoft identity platform and Windows. Right now we want to keep things simple and understand the basic folder structures of when an empty .NET Core MVC project is created. So we will select none inside the authentication. We will keep the configure for HTTPS selected. We do not want to enable Docker right now because we do not want to work with the containers. With this configuration, let's create our project. It will take a while, but it will create the project and it will load all of the files and folders. Great. So once the project is created, it will load the complete view of Visual Studio. On the left side here, we have the main panel where we will be coding everything. And on the right side, we have Solution Explorer, Git changes if we want to commit, and some properties. Now by mistake, if you close the Solution Explorer here, do not panic. You can open it back up by going to Views here, and we have the first option, which is Solution Explorer. With that in place, let's continue from the next video. Now that our project has been created, let's take a look at the files and folders that we have by default. The first thing that we should take a look at is the project file. In order to access the project file, you will right click on the project name, not the solution. We have our project with the website icon here. If you right click there, we have the edit project file. When you open that up, you will see view configuration right here. The first section here defines what is the target framework that we are using. We are using .NET 6, so you can see that right here. The next important thing inside this file is the item group. Item group will contain all the NuGet packages that we are using in the project. We selected the runtime compilation and that's why that package has been installed. In future, we will be installing more packages when we connect to database, use Entity Framework Core and so on. So in that case, when we add NuGet packages to our project, a new entry will be made inside the csproj file or the project file. Now usually you do not work with the project file but it is always good to know that we have all the packages and the references listed in the project file if in case you need to access that. So that covers our first file which is the csproj or the project file. Now that we have seen the project file the next thing that I want to show you is we have dependencies here and we can see the packages that we saw previously inside the project file will be installed right here. We will be adding more packages down the road. But the next folder that we have is the properties folder and inside there we have launch settings.json. In here we have the different profiles 
using which we can run our application. Like you can see inside the profiles, we have a bulky book web profile and we have an IIS Express profile. If we use the IIS Express profile, we know the port number that will be used here is explicitly defined. If we use the bulky book web, in that case, it will use 5000 and 5001 based on HTTPS or HTTP. The bulky book web is the default type. What this will do is it will run a .NET command line and that will trigger the application. So if you try to run this directly with bulky book web, you will first see a command prompt and then it will launch the website on port 5001. You can see inside the logs, it is displaying all of that. So that is one way or one profile to run our application. If you hover on this down arrow, you will see there is another profile, which is IIS Express, and that is the name that we have in launch settings. If you run with IIS Express, it will use the port number right here for the SSL. So let me run that and show that as well. Great, you can see it runs on the different port that is defined right here. So the default behavior is using the bulky book web profile, but we will be changing that and using IIS later on. So that was a brief overview on launchsettings.json. After that, the next folder that you see here is the www root folder. If you expand that, you will see all the static files of your project. So any static files like CSS, JavaScript, images, or any libraries, everything will go inside the www root folder. The www root folder will not have any C sharp files. This folder is only meant to serve the static files of our application. So we will be using the static folder extensively throughout the course when we are adding some JS or some images or any other libraries. The www root folder will be the root folder of your application. So always remember if you ever have to add any static file, it will always go inside the www root folder. Then we have the folders for controllers, models, and view. I will get back to them in a couple of videos. But the file after that is appsettings.json. This is the file in which we will be adding all of the connection strings and secrets of our application. Like you might have some API keys, you might have some send grid keys, you have Stripe payment keys, any of the static secret keys that you want to save we will be storing them inside appsettings.json. If you expand this app settings, you will notice that we have appsettings.development.json. So you can create new JSON files and it will automatically bundle them inside appsettings.json. Like if you create for another environment appsettings.staging.json, then you can have appsettings.production.json all of them will be bundled in one umbrella. And then based on the environment variable, you can configure it to use the different app settings file. Because connection string for a database in development will be different if you compare that to staging, preview, or production. So that way you can go into those configuration. We will be using just app settings.json right now because we will be working with the local host. Also in production, there are multiple ways of saving secrets like you can add them to Azure Storage Vault and much more. But that is beyond the scope of this course. To get started, you need to remember all of your application secrets must be inside appsettings.json and not directly inside any of your CS or class files. We will come back to this file in the later videos and we will add our connection string. Now the last file that we want to take a look at is program.cs. Let's do that in the next video. Next we have program.cs. This is the file that will be responsible for running the application. Once we open program.cs, you can see we have a variable builder 
where the web application dot create builder is passed with the built-in arguments. When you run with the .NET command, you can pass custom arguments here if you want. With that, it will configure the application and it will create the web application builder object. Now, in the previous video, we saw that we can use dependency injection with .NET Core. When we want to register anything with our dependency injection container, we will be doing that right here. So let's say if we want to register our database or email or anything else, we will have to do that between the builder and before we call build on that builder object. So right here, we are just adding one service to the container, which is builder.services.addController.s with views. We are adding this service to the container because we are using MVC application for our project. If you were using Razor Pages, then the service will be different. Now, in the future videos, when we configure database in our project and we add that to dependency injection, we will be adding a new service here in our container or DB context. If you are working with any version prior to .NET 6, or even some of the initial preview versions of .NET 6, then this file was divided into a separate startup.cs class file. And the services that we add to container were inside a method configure services, and everything from line 9 onwards was inside a configure method. So what we have on the top is we will be adding services to our container. Then we need to configure request pipeline and that pipeline will be configured from the highlighted section. Now you might be wondering, what is this pipeline? The pipeline specifies how application should respond to a web request. When your application receives a request from the browser, the request goes back and forth through the pipeline. Let me switch to the presentation here. We have different browsers here, and then we have a pipeline. The pipeline specifies how application should respond to a request that is received. When your application receives a request from the browser, the request goes through the pipeline. In the pipeline, you can add items that you want. Pipeline is made up of different middlewares and MVC is a type of middleware itself. So if we want an application to be built using MVC, we have to add that middleware. Other example could be authentication middleware, authorization middleware, and so on. What exactly happens is when your request will go through each of the middleware, it gets modified by them, and eventually it is passed to the next middleware. If that is the last middleware in the pipeline, the response is returned back to the server. Let's take a look at the few middlewares that we have in our application. Let me switch back to the code here, and you can see in the pipeline, first we are checking if it is development or not in the environment. If it is, then we are adding the use developer exception page that will show you user friendly exceptions so that you can debug and solve them. But if it is not development, then we are just redirecting them to an error page. The next middleware is HTTPS redirection, and then we have a middleware to use our static files that are defined in www root folder. We also have a routing middleware, and we have authorization middleware. When we add authentication to our project, we will have to add a new middleware inside the program.cs as well. Then we are using a map controller route that will map the different pattern that we have for MVC. Based on this routing, it will be able to redirect our request to the corresponding controllers and action. Then you should always keep in mind that order of pipeline is extremely important. The way you write middlewares in the pipeline, that is exactly how the request will be passed. So first routing will be done, then it checks for authorization and so on. So in this scenario, if you want to use authentication to your pipeline, we have a middleware which is app.useAuthentication. 
But if you do this, then it won't work because authentication middleware should always come before you authorize a user because you only authorize a user that is authenticated. That is the basic fundamentals of authentication and authorization. So if you place the pipeline in some different order, that will break things. Inside the endpoints here, you can see we have a controller name, an action name, and some ID. This controller route will make more sense when we understand routing in the next video. Let me show you more details on how routing works. I won't be running the application to show you that, but I want to walk you through some theory. You can see when it comes to routing in MVC application, we have controllers and we have actions. Before we explore the routing, let me walk you through the main components of an MVC application, which is models, views, and controller. Let me switch back to the presentation and give you a brief overview. Now, if you remember, we had three folders for models, views, and controllers, and that is what MVC stands for. The first thing in MVC is model, which represents shape of the data. A class in C Sharp is used to describe a model. The model component corresponds to all the data related logic that user works with. Let's say inside your application, you have a table that stores all the category or all the product details. Then that product will be a model itself. Model basically represents all the data in your application. It can be a table that you are storing inside SQL Server, or it can be a model, which will be a combination of multiple tables and so on. This model can either represent the data that is being transferred between views and controllers or any business related data model that will represent all the tables of the database. So if you have 10 tables in your database, we will have at least 10 models that corresponds to them. There is also more complexity, but we will go into those details later on. Right now, you can think of all the tables in your database will be a class file, which will be a model. Then all the properties of that class file will be the columns of the table. That is a simple relation that you can think of right now. Then we have view in an MVC, which is the user interface. View can be thought of HTML and CSS that you write to make things fancy and beautiful. Whatever you see on the website with your eyes is basically the view that is being displayed to you. But now you need to think of what happens if in a website you have a button and you click that button. What happens is that view will interact with your model to display some other data. But view does not interact directly with the models. For that, we have something known as controller. Controller acts as an interface between model and view to process all the business logic and incoming request. So controller acts as an interface between model and view to process all the business logic and it manipulates the data using model and interacts with the view to render the final output. This is just a brief overview of how model, views, and controller works. So let's say if a user clicks on a button, controller is the first thing that will receive that request. Then controller will have lots of action methods. Based on those action methods, controller will redirect this request to one of the action method and controller will use the model. It will fetch all the data that it needs to display inside the view. Once the view is rendered, it will pass all of that to the controller and controller will then pass a response which will be sent back and the user will finally be able to see the page. So you can see controller can be treated as heart of your application. That is where we will have all the logic of your application and it is the one which will be interacting with models and views. So with that in place, now you see that the request first comes to the controller and its action methods. 
So with that general idea, if we go back, you can see inside the map controller route, we have a pattern where we define a controller and an action method. So here we are saying that the default, if nothing is provided, it should go to the home controller and it should call the index action method. But that is a 10,000 feet overview. Let's take a look at routing little more with some theory. Before we see routing in action, let's see routing with some examples. You can see here we have a general pattern of routing. The first thing highlighted in blue here is the domain of the URL. When we run on the local computer, you will have a local host and a port number. Whatever is after that port number will be the route that we want to use when we are calling a page to be loaded. In the first example, you see we have something called as category, then we have an index and some number. When we are working with MVC, after our port number or domain, whatever is the first thing that we have will be the name of the controller. Then the next forward slash after that will be the action of the controller. And after that, if you have something, that will be the ID. This is the pattern of routing with MVC. If we go back to the application, you can see the same format right here. First, we have the controller name, then forward slash, we have an action name, then forward slash, we have the ID. That corresponds with the request that we have here. Keep in mind that ID is an optional field. Controller and action are not optional, but if they are not defined, we have set a default route that if there is no controller and action, you can use home controller and index action as the default route. Because of that, we have our home controller and we also have the index action, which I will show you. Before we dive into those details, based on the understanding that we have here, I have given some sample URL. I want you to try to find out what will be the controller, action, and ID based on this URL. Again, remember, if controller is not defined, default one that we have in our application is, let's go back the home controller, and if the action is not defined, that will be index action. So based on that, the first URL that we have, the controller name is category, the action is index, and we do not have any ID. For the next one, we have controller name as category, we do not have any action. So index will be the default action, and finally ID is null. Next what we have, for the third one, we have controller as category, action as edit, and ID as three. The last one, we have controller product, action details, and we have ID as three. So with that, if you get a URL, now you can identify what is the controller name, what is the action name, and if there is an ID or not. So with that brief understanding of routing, let's actually run our application, see routing in action in the next video. Now we want to understand routing in MVC. This is one of the tricky topics that I had when I first started learning MVC. So I want to make sure that you get familiar with the routing. Before we see the complete routing in action, let me walk you through the three folders that we have. We have a folder for controller, we have a folder for models, and we have a folder for views. By default, we have a home controller that has been created. Models will be all the data related models that we want in the project. So let's say if you are dealing with products that you want to display on the page, you will have a product model and we will be using that model in controller and views. Right now, you can just think of models as tables that you want in your database. If you want a product table, you will have a product model. That is not always the case, but we will explore models later on. The main thing that we want to work on is understanding controllers and views. Controller is the heart of the application. At the same time, views is what will be displayed on the screen when user is looking at the page. 
Now the way navigation works is when we have a home controller, all of the views or UI pages that are displayed with the home controller will be placed inside the same folder name as the controller name. So you can see they have also created a home folder by default. There is also a convention with the naming of controllers. It should always end with the keyword of controller. That is how the application will know that this is a controller. If we expand our home controller, you will see some code right here. We have a class with the name of home controller and it implements the default or the base class of controller. Then right here, we are registering the logger using dependency injection. Do not go into that detail right now. I will explain dependency injection in much detail. But for now, to understand routing, you can see we have two action methods. Inside controllers, you can have multiple action method. If we go back to the URL here, you can notice that we have the controller name and action name. If the URL was forward slash home, forward slash privacy, then it will go to home controller, look for a privacy action method, and it will load the content that we have here. The return type for an action method is I action result because I action result is an abstraction for multiple return type. It can return a view, it can redirect to some action method, or it can redirect a page, and much more. Then I said that if the URL is home forward slash index, it will return the view that we have defined here. Now you might be thinking that where is this view we are talking about? That view will be inside the views folder. The way it finds or maps the view for this index action method is inside the views folder, it will look for the name of the controller, which is home controller. So we have that folder. Inside there, we will have a view with the name of this action method and it is index action method. So that will be mapped to this particular view. If we open that view, we have some HTML and bootstrap classes. So here, nothing fancy is going on. We are just displaying some text. So let's run our application and see routing in action. Right now, it will run in the command prompt window. And once that is done, it will run the website on port 5001. In the URL, right now, nothing is present. What should happen if there are no controllers and actions in the URL? We define that inside the program.cs. We said if nothing is present, default that to home controller and index action method. So what we see on the screen is from the home controller index action method. To confirm that, if you go to the home controller, you can add a debugging point by clicking anywhere on the window. What that will do is when it hits this controller, this will be yellow. So if we go back and if we refresh the page, you can see it hits our breakpoint here. So that means if nothing is present in the URL, it is calling the home controller index action method. Let me also add a debugging point inside the privacy action method. So we will hit continue here and the request goes back. So we will hit continue and then here we have return view that will find out the view that is associated and it will display that on the page. If you right click on the view here, you have link to go to the view. If you click there, it will automatically redirect you to the index view because it knows it has to find the home folder. Inside there, there will be an index view. This is how controllers and views are associated. So if we go back to the application while this is running, we have the privacy tab here and you can see on the bottom right, the URL that it will go to is home forward slash privacy. So what will be the controller name? Controller name will be home and action name will be privacy. So it will go to the home controller, it will go to the privacy action method, and it will return the view. The view is inside home, we have privacy, and it should display this particular paragraph. Let's go back 
and hit that. It hits our debugging point. That is great. Let's continue. And it displays the privacy policy. So that is perfect. With this, you can see how routing is working in action with MVC. Based on the URL, you have to define the controller name and action name. It goes to the controller, finds out that action method, and it returns view based on the view that you have defined inside the views folder. Now, if this is too much right now, do not worry. Just understand the basics that I have taught you in this video. But as we proceed with the course, routing will make much more sense. And if this is too much for you, do not worry. You are not alone. When I was learning MVC about 10 years ago, at that time, I had a very hard time trying to understand this since I was coming from the web form world where we just have code behind files. So as we program this more, it will get much more familiar and you will love the way it works. So let's continue from the next video. Now that we have seen the basic controllers and views and how the interaction works with routing, I want to walk you through the basic views that are available with our project. We saw the home folder inside views that corresponds to the views of the home controller. But on top of that, we have something called a shared. Shared folder is used for partial views and partial views are similar to user components if you are coming from classic C Sharp. So it's basically a view that you can call within a view in multiple places in your application. Along with that, we have a special partial view, which is underscore layout. And this underscore layout is the default master page of your application. So if you open that up, you can see we have some styling on the top here. We have a header right here and we have a div where we render the body. Since this is the master page, so whatever we display inside the other views, it will use this underscore layout as the default master page. So inside index, when we are displaying this content, it was displaying that with the navigation on the top. We also have a footer here and we have some common JavaScript that we want across the application. We have the main HTML and body tag, and we have head right here where we are adding the styling. We will be updating this in future videos whenever we want to add some CSS and JS globally. This is the place where we will be adding that. Next, we have a validation scripts partial, and this is a partial view where we are just adding scripts for some validations. Wherever in some views, let's say in index view, we want to use validations, then we will include this partial view on that page. So that way we do not have to write those script tags. We will just include this partial view and that will be included. We also have an error partial view that will be used to display the errors if you encounter in the application. We will be adding more partial views as we proceed with the course. So do not worry, but remember shared folder will contain all the partial views and underscore layout is the master page of your application. While the application is running, if I switch back quickly, you can see on the privacy page, we have the header here, we have the footer here, and we have the body. So where we have this render body, at that place, whatever we had inside the privacy, these two lines are being displayed. So I hope that makes sense. Then we have something called as underscore view import and underscore view start. Let me open the view import first and we have the global namespace right here. So inside your application, let's say you want to access some namespace in all of the pages. If you add that using statement here, it will be accessible across all the pages controllers and classes in your project. That way you do not have to type this namespace every time. We will see that in action as we proceed with the course. But one important thing that you see here is tag helpers. Tag helpers are bindings that are provided by the .NET Core team that looks like HTML tags. 
but they are special tags that are adopted by the Microsoft team from other languages after looking at the success like Angular and React. I will show you one example quickly here in the underscore layout. If we go back to our application, we click on privacy, you see it builds the URL home and privacy. Here we know that home is controller and action name is privacy. So how do you think this link is provided on this navigation? It is provided using a special tag helper. Let me expand the header here and you can see we have an anchor tag and then we have tag helpers for ASP controller and ASP action. Tag helpers will start with the prefix of ASP hyphen and then the name. So here we have a tag helper which says ASP controller and then we define the controller name for routing and in that controller what action name should be called. So that is ASP action. Do not worry about the ASP areas for now. We will be using lots of tag helpers that are provided by the .NET team in future, but tag helpers have been included in the project and we define them globally inside the view imports file. The last file inside the views folder is the view start. This file will define what is the default master page for your application. Inside privacy, you see we have not defined what will be the master page, but it is by default using underscore layout because that is what has been defined inside the view start file. If you want to explicitly define a master page for privacy, which is different, you can do that directly by defining that on the top. And that will take preference over what is defined in view start. But view start will have the default master page for the application. Now I know this section was a little bit lengthy, but this overview was critical when it comes to understanding the default views that have been provided. In this video, let's take a look at tag helpers. Tag helpers are brand new to ASP.NET Core. Microsoft looked at the success around libraries like Angular, React, and decided that implementing an Angular directive-like experience in the new ASP.NET was so important to the adoption of .NET Core that they decided to create tag helpers from grounds up. Even though there are similarities between Angular directives and tag helpers, there is a major difference. Tag helpers are for server-side rendering while the Angular JS directives are all about client-side rendering. If you have worked with older versions of .NET Core, we had something called as HTML helpers. They are still around, but tag helpers are being modern with the tag-like approach, so it's much user-friendly. Tag helpers are very focused around the HTML element and are much more natural to use as compared to HTML helpers. We will be working with tag helpers many times in the application. But to just give you a brief overview, you can see in the first tab here we have HTML helpers and tag helpers simplifies all of them because we can use the existing label tag and we will just add a tag helper ASP4 and we will bind that to a model. We have same tag helper right here as well. Then in the last example here, I am displaying tag helpers where previously we were using HTML.beginForm. And now within the same form tag, we have the tag helpers of where it should be posted. So you can see things are getting much more simpler when we are using tag helpers. That being said, if you are coming to .NET brand new and you have never worked with HTML helpers, this is even better. You do not have to worry about the old syntax and what is different. We will be working with tag helpers in the upcoming videos, but I just wanted to give you a brief snippet of what tag helpers are and how they look like when we are using the same tags. We just use the ASP hyphen and then the tag helper name. That being said, we will explore all of this in much more details in the upcoming videos. 
when you will be working with a .NET Core application, you will see the return type of action result. And it does not matter if you are using an MVC application or a Razor page application. In both the cases, you can see we have iAction result. In MVC, we are returning back view in this example. And in Razor page, page handler, we are returning back to the page. But the return type is iAction result. iAction result is a generic type that implements all of the other return types. Now, if you want to be explicit about the return type in both of these cases, then that would look something like this. If the return type is view, you can write view result. But in Razor pages, when we return back to page, you can write page result. So now, what is the advantage of iAction result? So first, let's understand some theory. So action result is a parent class for many of the derived classes that have associated helpers. The I action result return type is appropriate when multiple action results return type are possible in an action. Let's take a look at some of the helpers and action result. So first, let's take a look at what is there in Razor pages. A Razor page can return content file, not found, page, a partial result, and redirect to different pages. For all of them, we have return types like content result, file content result, not found result, page result, partial result, and so on. If we are working with an MVC application, we can return back views, partial views, we can redirect to action, return JSON, and so on. So if you are returning any one of this, then you can use the individual return types for result based on the helper method. But what if you were returning something like this? Right here in MVC, you can see we are returning if true. Let's imagine there was some condition here. Based on that, if that condition is true, you want to redirect to action, else you want to return to view. This time, you cannot have two different return types. If you use view result here, return view is working, but redirect to action will throw error. Similarly, if you use redirect to action result, then redirect to action works, but return view will give you error. If you are working on Razor pages and you have the same situation, if you use page result, then return page will work, but redirect to page will fail. And if you use redirect to page result, then return page will fail. So what is the solution to all of this? The solution is to use iAction result in both the places. Because this is a parent class, so it does not care which of its implementation is being returned, it will be able to handle all of them. So that is a brief overview on how action result will help us with the return type from action method in MVC application or page handlers in a Razor page application. Now that the project has been created, there are few files and folder structures right here. We will go into all of these files and folder structure in the upcoming videos. But right now inside the views folder, we have home and inside there, we have index.cshtml. This is the default homepage of our application. So if I open this up, you will see there is some welcome text here and a paragraph which is inside a div tag. Let's run our application and see what is the output. It loads up the default page of the website where we have the project name here a home page and a privacy page. You can see on the home page we have some text right here. And that HTML is exactly the same as what we see inside the index.cshtml. I do not want to go into much technical details, but let's say you are making some changes inside your view. If you save that, you go back to the application, and if you refresh here, you directly see the changes right here. If you notice in Visual Studio 2022, there is this icon which is for hot reload.
this is a great capability that has been added with .NET 6. If this does not refresh and reload for you, you can go here and make sure the hot reload on file save is enabled. What that will do is whenever you make some change here and you save, if you go back and refresh, you can see the change is being reflected in the UI. This is very helpful when you are designing something with MVC or Razor application. But if you notice the first time you had to manually come to the page and refresh, and after that the hot reload automatically works. So I wanted to walk you through that advantage. Now if you were working with an application which is not in .NET 6, then you will have to right click on the project and you will have to add a NuGet package by clicking the manage NuGet package. You will search for a package runtime compilation and you can see we have microsoft.aspnetcore.mvc.razor.runtime. This package was needed before so you can hit the install button to add that to our project. Even though that is not needed here, I still want to add that. Then you will have to go to program.cs and right here we only have add controllers with view. When you add razor pages, you will add builder.services.addRazorPages and on there you will have to enable the add razor runtime compilation. But because of hot reload and the magic that we have, this is no longer required. So in the future videos when we will be adding the Razor pages, I also add the Razor runtime compilation because when the video was originally recorded in .NET 6, Hot Reload was still in testing. So that's why I have added the Razor runtime compilation down the road. But you can skip that and you will just add the builder.services.addRazor pages. So that's a brief overview that I wanted to give you with the hot reload in .NET 6. That being said, in the next video, let's first examine all the files and folder structures that have been created here. When we work with any web project, the main piece or the heart of the application is the data. And we need database to store our data. So we will be using SQL Server to create a database and store all the data for our website. With .NET Core, you might have heard about term called as Entity Framework Core as well. If not, do not worry, but Entity Framework Core is what we'll be using to create database and we will be using the same to perform all the data operations. So with .NET Core, you do not need stored procedures or writing SQL statements in the code. Entity Framework is a smart editor that will help us with all the data related operations. That being said, it does not mean that you cannot use stored procedures. You can still use stored procedures if you want. But typically with MVC application, Entity Framework Core is used to manipulate the data layer. We will go into those details in the upcoming videos. But right now, we first need to create our model. Model will basically resemble a table in database. It is not always the case, but whatever tables you have in your database, you will need a corresponding model for the code first migration. So inside the models folder, we only have error view model. Let me create one more model here. We will right click there and we will add a class file. We want to create a table for category so we will call our model as category and let's add that. It creates a public class file and it places it inside the namespace of bulky bookweb.models. That is just the location so it knows that it is inside bulky bookweb models folder. That is the category class right here. Now inside this category class, we need to create all the properties that we want for our table. We want to create ID, name, and a display order. So to start, we can write prop, and it is a code snippet. So once you type prop and hit tab two times, it will automatically create a property. The ID column, we will keep that as integer, 
and I will call that as ID. Next property that we want to create will be the name of the category. That will be a string. So we will create that. We press prop again. We want the display order. Now display order will be an integer. So let me add that. On top of that, let's say for locking purpose, we want to create a date time property, which will have the date on when this category was created. So we will call this created date time. Now the created date time, let's say we want to set a default value to that. So in order to do that, we can use equal to sign and we can just assign the date time dot now like this. That way the default value will automatically be assigned to the created date time when we create an object of this class. So perfect, we have created our model and then we want to push this model to our database to create a table with these four columns. But when we create a database table, we might want to add some more configuration. Like we might want to say that ID is a primary key and since it's an integer, we want to make that an identity column. So we do not have to populate that when we create a row inside the new table that we will create. We could also add a validation that name is a required property and it should not be null. If we had to write a SQL statement, we could have done all of that by using not null and identity in our SQL script. But how will we do that using Entity Framework? For that, .NET team has come up with alternatives called as data annotation. So on the property where you want to configure some more details, we have special attributes that you can use. Let me walk you through them in the next video. Now we want to configure some of the requirements that we have in a SQL script. Like we want to make this ID column an identity column, which will be the primary key of this table. In order to do that, we have a data annotation or an attribute known as key. If you enter that, you notice the red squiggly lines. If you hover on that, it would display an error that key attribute could not be found. That is because we have to add a using statement. So you need to make sure your keyboard is on the key and then if you press control dot, it will display that you can add using statement to resolve this. So we will press enter, that will add the using statement which has the data annotation that we want. Once this key annotation has been applied, it will tell Entity Framework Core that hey, when you create a script to create this table, you need to make sure that ID is a primary key and it should also be an identity column. It does all the configuration and talking by itself. We just need to write one attribute and everything will be done for us. Pretty simple, right? The next thing that we wanted to do is we want to make sure that name is a required property. So here we have another attribute which is required. Once you assign that, when it creates the script, it will make sure that name is not a nullable property. Now we have talked about these two, but there are more annotations that you can do for validation. With this in place, the initial iteration of our model looks good. How do we create that in our database now? Let's take a look at that in the next video. We have added the data annotations and we have created our model. We need to create a table and a database inside SQL Server. So let me open up SQL Server Management Studio. Make sure you have that installed on your machine because that is what we will be using to play with the database. Once the SQL Server Management Studio opens up, we will be using our local database. Now for some of the users, it could be local DB backward slash MS SQL local DB for others, it could be just a dot. I have both of the server name configured, so I will use any one of them and I will hit the connect button. As long as it is able to connect, that server name is what you will be using inside your connection string. If you use something else, then it won't work. So I will be using dot, 
but on your end you need to check if dot works you can use that or the local db ms sql local db should also work let's hit cancel here and if we expand the databases you can see we have few databases here but i want to create a new database for our project so for that we have to create a connection string inside our project in order to store all of the secrets of your application you will be doing that inside the app settings.json file you can hard code the connection string inside the class file but that is a bad approach app settings.json file is the file where you should have all the secrets that way if you have to update anything in the future you know it will be available inside the app settings.json file and then you can create different app settings for different environment like if you have development staging preview production you can create all of those app settings and you can configure to use that app settings when you deploy the application that way based on your environment name you can use different app settings or different database and so on we will be working directly in app settings.json and that should work with the local development so this is a simple json file now how will we add a new connection string in here as you can see it is just a dictionary with string key and value pairs what you have inside logging is known as a block where inside the logging block we have another block of log level and that has three key value pairs so we can either create a block or we can directly configure the connection string now the dotnet team thought that connection string is very common and almost all of the projects will have a connection string that is why they have created a default block for connection string that we can use if we want you can use something else but you can also use the default block name that they have given if you see it is automatically suggesting me that block name which is connection strings we can use something else but i want you guys to use the exact same name for now and i will also tell you the reason behind that in the upcoming videos so inside this block we will have a key value name so that key name you can use whatever you want i will just use default connection you can use any name that you want for the key right here and we need to paste or enter our connection string within the double quotes on the right side so the first parameter here will be the server name i am using dot so that is what i will write if you are using a different server name like if we go back to sql server and if you were using the ms sql local db to connect i want you guys to copy this go back to the application and paste that here i am using the local server with the dot so that is what i will use and then we need the next parameter if you have to separate anything in a connection string we will use a semicolon the next property that we have is the database name let's call this bulky then after that we want to set the trusted connection flag to be true make sure there is no spelling mistake here and that is all that we want to configure in the connection string you can make it more complicated but we will keep things pretty simple we have a database name that we want to create inside this particular server that we are able to connect in sql server and the trusted connection is true that way when we connect here we can just use windows authentication if you have a user id and password then you can use the different settings in connection string i will be using the default trusted connection so with this we are using a special block that is available with the name of connection string in there we have a key of default connection and value has the connection string now how can we use this connection string to actually create the database and create our category table inside the database let's do that in the next video we need to tell our application that we will be using sql server and you have to use this connection string to establish the connection with sql server for that we will be using entity framework core 
and we will have to create an object of the DB context. Using that DB context, we will be able to make connection to the database. So how do we do that? It is best to create a new folder for all the data related changes. So here, let me create a new folder with the name of data. Inside there, we will create our DB context. We will create a class here, and I will call that application DB context. You can use any name that you want here, but I'm using DB context so that it's easy to identify. Let's add that class file. Now we need to inherit this class file from the DB context that is inside Entity Framework Core. In our project, we have not added Entity Framework Core right now. So there are two ways to add that. We know that this will inherit from the DB context, so we can type that and you will see the red squiggly lines. On there, if you press Ctrl dot, inside the suggestions, it will display that you can install a package microsoft.entityframework.core that will automatically find and install the latest version. If you want to do that yourself, you can right-click on the project and you can select Manage NuGet Packages or you can go to Tools, we have NuGet Package Manager and we can open up Manage NuGet Packages for solution. Here you will have to go to the Browse tab to see all the NuGet packages that are available. Now right now I'm using .NET 6 with the preview version, so I have checked the include pre-release right here. The package that we are looking for is Entity Framework Core. Let's press enter and the first package is Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore. We are using the preview 7, so let me select that and we will install that. Once that is installed, if we go back to our application DB context, and now if we press control dot here, it will tell us that we just have to add the using statement since we have already installed the package. So we will add the using statement for our DB context. Once we do that, then there is one line of configuration that we have to do inside the constructor of this class file. You can think of that as the general syntax that is needed to establish the connection with Entity Framework. So first we need to create a constructor. You can type CTOR and press tab twice. You can see it is a code snippet for constructor. So once you press tab twice, it should automatically create the constructor. We just have to write some parameters here because when we get the DB context, we need to pass that on to the base class, which is DB context. So here we will have to configure the DB context options on the class that we are on right now, which is application DB context. We can paste that here and I will call this options. So here we are saying that in the constructor here, we will receive some options and those options we just have to pass to the base class which is DB context. This is a general setup that you have to do that will configure our DB context. Now, once you configure our DB context, we still have one main feature. We still have to create our category table inside the database. So whatever models that you have to create inside the database, you will have to create a DB set inside the application DB context the file that we are currently working on. Now, how do you create a DB set? That is pretty simple. We will say public DB set here, and we need to write the model name. That model name is category, and once you write that, you again see the red squiggly lines. That is because it cannot find anything with the name of category in the same file. We need to add the using statement to tell it that category is inside the models folder. So if we press control dot, we have that using statement. Let's add that. And the next parameter here is the table name. So if you call this categories, then inside database, the table that will be created 
will be called as categories and not category. So that looks good and we will add the getter and setter. That's all that we had to do to create the category table. What this will do is it, it will create a category table with the name of categories and it will have four columns that we have wrote inside the category model. When it creates that table, it will make sure that ID is an identity column and name is a required field as well. So you can see it is doing all the configuration by writing just few lines of code. Now when you are working with Entity Framework Core, there are two models. One is code first and one is database first. What we are doing is code first because here we are writing the code of our model and based on that model, we will be creating the database. So that is the code first approach. Database first approach will be something where database is already created and based off that database, you will be scaffolding models. I personally am a big fan of code first and that is what I have been using in all of my production application because I do not come from a DBA management point of view. I am more of a full stack developer who works with the code. So if Entity Framework Code will manage database for us, I will be very happy with that approach. So with that, we have added our DB set for the category table, but we are missing one small configuration. Our application still does not know that it has to use the connection string that we wrote in app settings. And it still does not know that it has to use application DB context to create a DB context and that it has to work with SQL Server. So let's see how we can pull everything together in the next video. We just need to tell our application that it has to use the DB context, which is inside application DB context, and then it has to use a SQL Server using the connection string that we defined inside the app settings.json. We will tell our application to do that inside program.cs where we configure the services that our application will use. So here we have the comments to add the services to the container. Make sure you always do that before you build the builder. So right here, we want to add a new service. So on builder.services, the service that we want to add is DB context. So you can see we have dot add db context and that expects a class file. The class file that we are using for db context is the application db context. If you press control dot, we will just have to add the using statement to the data folder. Now when we configure this db context, if we go back to the application db context, right here we are passing the options and we are sending those options to the base class. So inside options, we have to configure use of SQL Server and connection string. So here we will say options goes to, this is just the syntax, we will say options dot, there is a method with the name of use SQL Server, but it will not be available like that. Even if you press control dot, it will not give you the package name that you have to add. So for that, we will have to go back to the manage NuGet packages and we will have to install a package which is SQL Server with Entity Framework Core, which is Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore.SQLServer. Make sure you are using the consistent version. If one version of the package you are using is Preview 7 and other one is Preview 5 or even .NET 5, then things won't work and you will run into error message. So always make sure that you are using the same version. Let me install the SQL Server and we will close the NuGet packages. Now, if you press Control dot, you will see the using statement using Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore. We will add that and on this SQL Server, we have to write the connection string. So where exactly is our connection string? That is inside app settings, we used a special block with the name of connection strings. Since we wrote our connection string 
inside the special block theme that I was talking about, we can directly use the key value here to extract the connection string. Let me copy this name. We will go back to our program.cs and right here on builder.configuration, we have an existing method that is provided, which is get connection string. Inside this method, we have to pass the string name, which is default connection. Once you use that, it will automatically find the connection string and configure our SQL server. Now this get connection string is a special method and this method will only look for this default connection inside a block with the name of connection strings. If you named this connection strings one, then it will not be able to find this connection string because this method will only look inside the block, which is connection strings. So that is why I said to name it exactly the same. If you wanted to name it something else, we have different ways of getting that, but I do not want to go into those details right now. So with this, our DB context will be configured with the connection string. So all the configuration is done that was needed for the DB context. Now we are on the final step where we have to create database and then the table inside SQL Server. Let's take a look at that in the next video. Now that the program.cs has been configured, the next step that we have is to actually create the database and the table. When you are using Entity Framework code first, there are migrations that you have to run using Entity Framework to push the changes to database. It is not as complex as it sounds. We have done all the setup that is needed. In order to run the migration, you will go to Tools, NuGet Package Manager, and this time you will select the Package Manager console. The first thing that you have to do is you have to add a migration. Migration is basically keeping a track of all the DB changes that are needed and once that migration is created, you push that migration to the database to actually create the database or make changes to your table. Let's see what that is. The command to add a migration is add hyphen migration, and then we have to give our migration a meaningful name. Do not use any spaces when you are writing the name. The name that I want to give to our migration is add category to database. Let's hit the add button and we see an error message. The error is because when you run add migration, you have to add a new get package. You see the term add migration is not recognized. I want you guys to copy this error and try to find out what is the package that is missing from Google. I can give you the answer directly, but I want you guys to Google what package is required based on this error message. If you just copy that error and paste it here, you will see the very first and if you scroll down, you will see the package name. It is so simple. Just install microsoft.entityframeworkcore.tools. That is the package that is required to enable migrations in your project. Whenever you face any error, it is best to just Google that error. That way you can find the solution much easily and much quicker. So let's go to our project, manage NuGet packages. We will paste the package name and we will install the same version that we have in our project. Perfect, that is done. We can close this. I can open up the package manager console again and I will run the same command one more time. This time it should complete successfully. And if you notice on the right hand side here, a new folder with the name of migrations is created and there are two files that got added. Our migration file is the first one and that is opened up on the screen as well. Inside migrations, we have two methods, one is up and one is down. The up method is what needs to happen inside the migration and down is if something goes down, we need to roll back the changes. So do not worry about the down right now. Let's see what's happening inside the up method. On the migration builder, 
we have a method with the name of create table and it is creating that table with the name of categories that is the exact name that we defined right here so it will create a table with the name of category and then that will have columns the first column will be the id column which will be of the type integer and nullable is false since we said it is a key column it is automatically making that an identity column and incrementing that by one every time pretty smart right the next thing is the name column and you can see the nullable is false here if you did not add the required property then nullable would be true you will say that display order is also nullable false but we did not add that inside category and the reason behind that is it is an integer property and not a string that is why nullable is false because it's an integer last we have the created date time of the type date time 2 and that looks good if you see on the constraints it is also adding a primary key on the id column with a name so migrations is exactly what we wanted but can we take a look at the sql that gets executed no what entity framework code does is based on this migrations it will create an optimized version of the sql query and it will automatically run that on the database you do not have to do anything with that what you work with is just the models you create a migration and you push that to the database so once you verify that migration is looking good you can just run the command update database and that will push the migrations to database we have an error here let me go to app settings and of course we do this will not be colon this will be equal to right here and they are separated by a semicolon that was my bad we will go back to the package manager and you can also see the error said server and colon was not supported because it should be equal to let's update the database one more time perfect the migrations were completed but what actually happened is first it will connect to the server it will check is there a database with the name of bulky there won't be anything right now so it will create that database first and then the migrations here it will convert them to sql and execute them on our database so if we go back now if we refresh the database you will see the new database with the name of bulky and if you open the tables there will be two tables let's examine the columns inside the categories table it should have four columns and that looks great now what is inside the ef migrations if you do the select top thousand entity framework code keeps a track of which migrations have been applied so next time when you run the update database it will not apply the same migration it will only apply the migrations that have not been applied on this database entity framework code is pretty smart with all the configuration and tracking that it needs to do so with that using entity framework core we have created our database and we have added our table based on the model inside our main project so with that let me continue in the next video now before we work on anything else let me run the project right now it is running on port 5001 let me change that so that the command prompt is not opened every time we can just run that using iis profile by clicking here that way it won't run on the port 5001 it will get the new port that is defined in the project config i'm getting an error that i'll have to open visual studio under an admin account so let me do that real quick we will open the project again we have the iis express here let's try to run it this time and perfect so we have home and privacy but both of these pages are inside the home controller now in category we will be creating editing and deleting category so for that rather than working on the home controller let's create a new controller for our category so inside the controllers folder we will right click 
add a controller and we have few options here. We will go with the empty controller to keep things very simple and start from scratch. I will call that as category controller. Now when you name a controller, make sure that you append controller at the end. That is a required field. Whatever name you want must come before the controller. So once you have that name, we will click the add button. Perfect, we get an empty controller with index action method. Our home controller also had the index action method and our category controller also has the index action method. But the index action method in home controller has a view that is inside the home folder. Our category action method does not have a view right now. You can add the view in two ways. First, you can create a folder with the name of controller, which is category inside the views, and then you can add index view inside there. Or if you want to do that directly from the controller, you can just right click on the action and you have add view. We will be selecting the razor view here. Let's hit the add button. Now, when you add a razor view, there are few configuration that you have to do. First, what will be the name of the view? We will give that the same name as the action method, which is index. Then do you want to use any templates when you create this view? If you hover here, you can create a view for create, delete, details, edit, and list. I do not want to go into those details right now, but we will come back to that later on. If you change that, then model and data context class will be enabled. But we don't want to focus on that right now. We want to start scratch with an empty template. Next is a partial view. Partial view is basically like user controls in the web form. So it will be rendered inside some other view. So if you select a partial view, the layout page will not be used because you do not need any master page if you create a user component because you will be calling that inside some other view. We don't want to take a look at that right now. Let's keep it simple. Next, we will use the layout page. We want our view to use the default master page. So if you keep it blank, it will by default use the layout that we have set inside the view start, which is underscore layout. We want it to be consistent. So that is what we will be using and we will hit the add button. It will scaffold few dependencies and then it will create the view. If you had any errors while building the project and if you try to scaffold that will fail, it will ask you to resolve the errors and only once your project is building successfully, you will be able to scaffold the views. So perfect, our view has been created and let me call this index category. With that, let's continue in the next video. We want to display all the categories, if there are any, in the table format inside the index view. For that, we will have to actually retrieve all the category list from our database inside the index action method. So let me open up the layout page right here, where we have two options of index and the privacy page. Rather than privacy, let me display the category right here. And in order to go to the index page, how can we navigate to this particular view that was created? It is inside category controller and we have index action method. So here to navigate, we can define the controller name is category and the action method is index. We are not using areas here, so you can keep that blank or you can also remove them if you want. If you save this, let's run the project one more time and make sure we are able to navigate to our action method. So we have category, when we click there, perfect, we see the index categories, that is what we have inside the view. So we are able to navigate there successfully. Now we need to retrieve all of the categories from our database. So let me switch back to database and just for dummy purpose, let me edit the top 200 and let me add something here. So I have just created one dummy record 
inside the table right now. I have created one dummy record inside the table. Let's go back and we want to retrieve that inside the category controller. Now I have said before that we will be using Entity Framework Core and the main file that we have is the application DB context. Using that we can access our database object because inside that file we have the categories table. So how can we create an object of this application DB context and use that to call our database and table? That is the beauty of dependency injection. We do not have to create an object of this class. Everything will be done for us because we have configured that inside our container, we want to use this service. So because of dependency injection, we will not have to create its object. We can think that the object is already there. We just have to tell application that please send me the object of application DB context. How do you request that? Inside the controller, you want the application DB context to work with database. So I will first create a private read only field, which will be application DB context. And I will call that underscore DB. We will add the using statement there and great. Now we need to tell our application that we need an implementation of this application DB context where the connection to database is already made and I can retrieve some records right away. So for that, you will have to use constructor, CTOR, tab, tab. And here, whatever is registered inside the container, you can access that. Inside our container, we have registered application DB context. So inside the constructor, we can get an implementation of that just like this. So this DB will have all the implementation of connection strings and tables that are needed to retrieve the data. So we will populate our local DB object with this implementation. So we'll say underscore DB is equal to DB. And then we can use this underscore DB to retrieve our categories. The syntax of that is very simple. We will create a var, let me call this obj category list. We will first access the underscore db and on there we will have all the db set. The db set that we want to work on right now is categories and we want to convert it to a list and retrieve that. So it will go to database, it will retrieve all of the categories, it will convert that to a list and it will assign that inside the category list. You can see how beautiful this is. You do not have to write a select statement to retrieve all the categories from the table. There is no SQL coding required. You just have to write underscore db dot the db set name and that will retrieve all the records. You convert that to a list and you assign that to a variable. Now, how do we test that this is working? We will add a debugging point by going to this pan. You see the red dots. If you click here, we are setting a debugging point. Then if you run IIS Express here, your application will hit the debugging point when we load that page. So if we click on category, it will hit a debugging point. You can see that is yellow now. And if you hover on the category list, you can see there is one count. If you expand it more, you can see it is the same record that we created inside the database. So it goes to the database, it fetches the categories, and it does that automatically. We have a list that is already populated here. We just need to pass this list to our view and we can run a for each loop on that list and we can display all the categories. Let's do that in the next video. Let me remove the breakpoint and let's do that in the next video. Now that we have all the categories inside this particular object, we can copy that and we will pass that to our view. And I do not like using variables here. I am a fan of using the strongly type. So this will be I enumerable of category. We will have to press control dot to add the using statement. 
Now, since we have an I enumerable here and not a list, if you want, you can also remove the dot to list. That is not a required thing, but if this was a list, then you would have used the dot to list. So we are passing that to our view. Now that we are passing an I enumerable of category to our view, we need to capture that inside our view as well. So let me open up that view I have right here. But if you do not have that open, you can go to category and index view. So right here, we first need to capture the model that we are passing from the controller. For that, you will be using at the red sign and you will write model in all lowercase. If you make this a capital model, that won't work. In order to fetch what is being passed from the view, you have to use all lowercase at the rate model sign. So what exactly is being passed from the controller action method? It is an I enumerable of category. We can copy this and we can paste that right here. That way our view knows that whatever we receive here will be an I enumerable of category. Since it is I enumerable, we can iterate through that. Now, if you have never worked with Razor pages, you can use both HTML as well as some C sharp code directly inside the view. So first, let's use the table attribute, gives that some classes of table, table bordered to give it a border, and we'll say table striped. We can also give it a style of width 100%. Inside the table, we have T head and T body. Let me add both of them. So T head will be for headers. So we will have a TR tag in there and a TH tag. What will be all the columns that we have to display? The first one will be category name and the next one will be display order. You can also display the date, time and ID if you want but we just want to display two columns. That is the header. Now inside the body, we will need a for each loop to iterate through the I enumerable and display the actual values. As I said before, we can use C sharp code directly inside the views using the at the rate directive. So if you press at the rate, you will see we have a for each right here. Syntax is pretty simple. We will create a var here, we can call that obj, and that is inside our model of the page. So on top, we use the lowercase model, but here model will have the first letter as capital. So you can see how it is different. That way it will iterate through all of the properties inside this model in a for each loop. Now for each of the property, we want to display a table row. So we will add tr here. In that, we want the td tag. First, we want to display the name. So again, that name is inside the c sharp variable object. So we will use the at the rate sign and we will say obj.name. I can give it a width of 50% here. And we can copy this and paste it one more time. Then we have display order. So we will say obj dot display order. Let's give it a width of 30%. This looks great. Let me save this and run the application. If we go on category now, you will see our one category that we have inside the database. This is looking perfect to display all of the categories. Next, what I want is edit and delete buttons here. And I want to make this a little bit more pretty. For that, I will be using Bootswatch themes and let me show you that in the next video. Python loves a pretty application. Because of that, I want to use Bootswatch.com, which has free themes for Bootstrap. If we scroll down, I want to use the Solar theme for our project. We can hit the download button and let's download the Bootstrap.css. Let's open that file and it is using Bootstrap 5. That's perfect. Let's copy this complete Bootstrap and let me stop the application at www root 
where we have CSS. Our bootstrap is inside the lib folder. But here, let me just create a new item style sheet. We'll call that boots watch theme. And let me add that. I will paste the theme that we copied and we will be using this in our project. Looks good. Let me save this. Another change I would do is inside site.css, they have added a BTN primary. So let me remove that and the anchor tag. We will be using what is there inside our Bootswatch theme. In order to add this to our project, we will have to go to underscore layout and we should have our CSS at the very top. This time we do not want the default bootstrap theme. We want to use our bootswatch theme.css. Now, since we are using bootstrap 5 with bootswatch, if we go to bootstrap.com, let's click on getting started. Introduction, we are in bootstrap 5. Let me copy the JS bundle that we have here. We will copy that and we will go back to our project inside the underscore layout. Let me replace the JS bundle that we have with the one that we copied. As of this recording, the default version of Bootstrap is not 5 in .NET 6. This might change in future, but that is the reason I'm switching to the latest version of Bootstrap. With that change, let's run the application and see if something is different. Great, you can see a dark theme has been applied, so things are getting different. Let me switch back to the Boots Watch and let me go back to the theme that we have. Let's click on Preview. Here we have a nav bar, let's use that. I will copy everything that we have here. Let's go back to our application and I will paste that right here before the nav bar that we have. Now, since we are making changes inside the view, if you remember when we created the project, I enabled the Razor runtime compilation. So what that should do is when we save here and if we go back to our application and refresh, it should load the changes because we are making changes directly inside the view. But that does not seem to work as you can see. The reason behind that is we added the package of Razor runtime compilation. Even though these are Razor pages, if you examine the program class file, we are only adding controllers with views. We will have to make one small change here. On builder.services, we will have to add Razor pages. And on that, we have add Razor runtime compilation. I don't know why it is like that, I believe in future they will also add this with the views, but right now this is only available with Razor pages. So this is one extra line that we have to add in an MVC project to get that runtime compilation. With that change, let's run the project one more time. And great, we see the new navigation menu right here. We don't want everything else here. Let me comment that. We will just add the home and category. Let me go back here to underscore layout and I can just copy the home. Let me cut this. I can paste that right here. Let me scroll down where we have the other category controller. Cut that and we will paste that instead of features. Perfect. I will remove these two. The one in drop down, I can just leave that in comments so that in future, if we want a drop down, we can use that. And I can remove the nav bar altogether. Let's go back and refresh. And great, this time we did not have to rebuild the application. The text here is not visible. So let me go back. And we don't want the text dark anymore. We can remove that. And perfect, looks much better. If you click on home page, it loads the home page and category should display all the categories. Great, I also want to hide this border. So that should be inside footer. 
we have border top we can remove that and we can give it a background of bg dark let's go back and refresh and this looks much better so with this now we are using bootstrap 5 in our project and we are using the bootswatch theme let's continue in the next video inside our index view what we can do is we can add a button here to create a category so if we go back to our index let me add a little bit of more designing with bootstrap we will add a div give it a class of container and padding of three these are just the bootstrap classes in there we will add a div give it a class of row and padding top of four let me add test here save that and go back that will create a new row right here i want to divide this row into two parts by default bootstrap divides each row into 12 parts if we want but if we just want to divide it in two parts then we will have six in one and six in the other so here we will add a div give it a class of column six that will combine the first six in one div and we will add another div give it a class of column six so that will divide the screen in two parts the first one we want to display and heading so h2 give it a class of text primary and we want to display category list here let me save this go back and refresh and looks good let me close this container at the very end so we'll close that div at the end and right here we want to add a button right here we want to add a link inside there we want to go to a new action method that we will create inside the category controller that will be for creating a new category so right here we will say that should go to the same controller which is the category controller and it should go to an action method which will be create we do not have that yet but we will create that in the next video we can also add a couple of bootstrap classes btn btn primary and here we can say create new category let me save this go back and refresh and we have our button let's align this button on the right hand side in bootstrap 5 we have text end we will save that and that will bring it to the right side then let me just leave a couple of lines here i can just add few br tags and this looks much better now i also want to use some icons here like font awesome but with bootstrap 5 they have given their own sets of icons so why don't we use that if you go to getbootstrap.com we have the icons tab getting started with all of these icons is super simple i used to like font awesome but you had to register and do lots of things this is available quickly you just click the install button and you have the cdn you copy that go to the underscore layout styles we will paste the cdn with that the icons are readily available to use let's go back to the bootstrap and right here let me search for plus if you scroll down we have this plus circle if you click there we have the link here we will copy and we just paste it before create category let me add a space let's save that and you will see the icons are working perfectly super easy to get started with that we have added icons but if you click the create new category you will see page not found that is because it is going inside category controller create action method but inside category there is no action method with the name of create so let's add that in the next video let me copy the index action method and we can paste that one more time we will have to change the name here to create and this will be a get action method 
Now, when someone hits the create button, we will give them the option to enter their name and display order and create a category. So when the view is being loaded, you do not have to pass any model. You can keep that blank and then you can create a model directly inside the view. What do I mean by that? Let me create a view here. We will right click, add view, razor view. We will keep that empty and looks good. Let me add that. Now, previously when we were working with index, I said that this is the model that will be passed from the controller. That is true, but it is not always the case. Like in our create, we are not passing anything from our controller, but we still want to work on the category model and we want to fetch its properties when we submit the form. So for that also, you will have a model for this view. That model will be the category model. So the model that you write inside view is not always the model that is passed from the controller. But if you are passing a model from the controller, it must match what you have inside the model in the view. But if you are not passing anything inside the controller, like in create, then you can bind your view with a model based on the data that you're collecting on the page. Here we are collecting the name and display order. We will use category so that we can use tag helpers to bind everything for us. Now you might be thinking, what is this new term tag helpers? I will walk you through that. But before that, let me create a form here. Give it a method of post because we will be posting our data because we want to create our category. In there, I will create a div, give it a class of border, padding of three and margin top of four. In there, I will add a div, give it a class of row and padding bottom of two. And we will add a heading here, which will have a class of text primary for the yellow color. And we will display the heading, which is create category. Let me add a HR here, save this and run the project. I want to see the view while we are building that. So if we go to our category now, and if we hit the create category button, it will take us to the create category view that we created. Here, I want to display a label and a text box. So outside of this div, I will add another div, give it a class of margin bottom three. In there, we want to display a label. You can just do label and give it a name like this. That will work. But what we want to do is we want to bind everything on this page with our category model. Because of that, the .NET Core team has provided tag helpers, which starts with ASP. So here we have ASP hyphen four. When we add that in a label, we can use any of the properties from our model. So you can see it is already displaying created date time, display order, name and ID. We will select name here and we do not have to populate anything else. If we go back and if we refresh, the output will be same because what it does here is it displays the name of the property inside our category model. So we have it as name. So that is what it will display in the UI as well. Let's go back to the create view. And now we want an input field. So we will say input and we will just say ASP for tag helper. This input is for name. That way it will do all the binding. And when this form is posted, it will post an object of this category class with the name populated. We can give it a bootstrap class of form control. Let me save that and refresh. Oops, I closed that. Let me run it again. And great, you can see a text box right here. This looks good. Let me also add a text box for the other field, which is display order. So I will just copy this, paste it here. The ASP4 will be display order this time. Let me save that, go back and refresh and create. This looks good. 
you can notice the name of the label is display order without a space and that is because inside category that is the property name itself we will fix that in just a second but i wanted to show that now let me add a button here to actually submit the form and i will add a link to go back to the index page of the category controller so we'll go to create here and we will add a button give it a type of submit we will also give it some bootstrap classes of btn btn primary and i will give it a width of 150 pixels i will call this button as create next i want to add a link here this link i want to go back to the index action method inside the category controller to load all of the categories so it is more like a back button link so first what is the controller name that is the category controller and what is the action in there that is the index action we will give it some bootstrap classes btn btn secondary and i will also give it a style with the width of 150 pixels within here we will display back to list let's go back and looks better if we click on back to list you can see that is functional now in the next video we want to hit the create button and create our category with that let's continue from the next video now i want to create the category when we populate the details and hit the create button so when we hit the create button we will have to create a post action method inside the category controller and in that post action method we will already be fetching the category object that is populated because we used tag helpers so inside the category controller we can copy this create and paste that one more time let me stop the application inside the parameters we will be receiving a category object let me call that obj this will be post action method now if an action method is post we have to write the attribute http post on top of that the dotnet team has a per and then we also have to validate the anti forgery token anti forgery token is there to help and prevent the cross site request forgery attack what it basically does is inside any forms that you have inside the application it will automatically inject a key there and that key will be validated at the step that key must be valid to prevent the cross site request forgery i have explained the cross site request forgery and the validate anti forgery token in much details inside free content on dotnet mastery if you search and look for cross site request forgery you can find that video on youtube and watch that i do not want to change the focus of this course so we will just validate that token on all of the post request this is not required but i will highly recommend that to avoid the cross site request forgery now once we have the category object that is populated with name and the display order we want to create that record inside the database so to do that we will use our db context and on there we have the categories then in order to retrieve categories we did not have to write anything else but when we have to add something to the table we have the add method there and you can see it expects a category entity we already have that inside the obj that is what the user populated so we will add that to our database now once you add it to the database it is not pushed to the database right now it will be pushed to the database when you run the command underscore db dot save changes at that point it goes to the database and saves all the changes once the changes are saved we have return view here that will take us back to the same category view let's say when we are done let's go back to the index so that we can see the new category that was created so rather than return view we want to redirect to an action we want to redirect to the index action it will look for this index inside the same controller 
if you had to go to an action method in some other controller, you can define the controller name right here. But since we are in the same controller, we can just mention index and that will work. Let's run our application and try this out. Let's go to our category and let's create a new category. I will call this test display order 12 and create. You can see it has been created. If we go back to our SQL Server, let me close this. And if we do select top 1000, now we see two records. So perfect, this is working as expected. And we are able to create a new category now. But our create category is not perfect. If you hit the create button, you will run into an exception. Let me switch back to the project. And you can see the exception is cannot insert null inside the column name. We do not have any validations, but inside database, we said that this was a not nullable column. So when the entity framework code tries to save, it gives the exception. Pretty smart. But we have to be much smarter to handle the validations. Let's take a look at them in the next video. Now when we try to create a category without any fields populated, right now we see some error message because it cannot add an object when in the database we have validation. But that is not a good approach because we are throwing exception in that case. What should happen is we should handle our validations inside the server side, which is controller, as well as inside client side, which is inside the create view. So how do we handle validations? Let's first do that at the server side. So when we receive a model here, we can check whether this model is valid or not. And what defines a valid model is the validations that we have right here. Name should be a required property. So let's go back and let's make sure that our model is valid. In order to check that with .NET Core, we have model state dot is valid. That will determine if the model is valid or not. If that is valid, we want to create and redirect to index. If that is not valid, we just return back to the view with the object. Let me run this and show you what happens. I'll add a debugging point on if the model state is valid. So let's run our application. Let's try to create a category with no fields populated. We hit our breakpoint and if you examine the is valid flag is false. So our model state is not valid. Great. But now which property in our model state is not valid? It is important to know that because right now we just have two properties. It could be possible we have over 50 properties in a model. So in that case, you hover on model state, you expand that, Inside the error counts, you see we have two errors. If you hover on the values here, result view, you will see which properties are not valid. You can see display order is not valid as well as name is not valid. Let's continue here and this time let me populate display order and hit the create button one more time. Model state will still be not valid. But this time if you examine, the error count is only 1 because we already fixed one of the errors by providing display order. So now you can see display order is valid but name is still invalid because it is a required field. Our server side validations are working. But with that, it would be helpful if we are displaying an error message right here so that user can know why it is failing. Doing that is super simple. We will remove the breakpoint here and let me go to the view. Just like we have ASP for tag helper, we also have a tag helper for validation. So inside name, we can add a span tag and we have the tag helper ASP validation for. On this, you have to define the model. So we want to check validations for name here and if there are any errors, we want to display them in red color. So we can give it a bootstrap class of text danger. We will copy the span and we will paste that for display order as well. With that in place, make sure to save this 
and we will go back and refresh the page. Let me just reload this. And this time, if you try to hit the create button, you can see the default error message is displayed. The first one that we have is name is a required field and display order value now is invalid because it's an integer. So with that, we can display the default error messages right here. So with that, we have our server side validations in which it checks at the controller level if the model state is valid or not. If it is not valid, it populates the model state with error message, it returns back the OBJ, and it automatically displays the validations that we have added. We did not have to write JavaScript or any other complex code. It is doing all of that with the help of tag helpers. Let's continue in the next video. With server-side validations, what if you want to display a summary at the top with all the error message? If you want to do that, .NET Core has a solution for that. You will need a div this time and not a span that you were using with validation for. And inside div, you can see we have a tag helper, ASP validation summary. This will be all. In this case, it will display all the validations at the top in a summary format. Once we make this change, let's go back and refresh here. If you hit create, great, now you see the error messages at top as well. When you select all, it will display models as well as properties. If you want to limit that, you can change that to model only and none. But if you are using validation summary, I personally like all, and this is great. Now along with that, what if we want to add some custom validation? Like let's say inside the controller here, we want to make sure that we do not add any category which has the same name and display order. How can we add that to the validation? So before we confirm if the model state is valid, we can check here if obj.name is equal equal to obj.displayOrder. We will have to convert that to a string. If this is the same, we want to tell our model state that this is not valid. So for that on the model state itself, we can add custom model errors. Here we have a key and value pair. You can give any key name that you want. We will call this custom error. If you want, you can also use string.empty. But since this is a key, you have to make sure that you do not use the same key two times. Let me add a custom error that the display order cannot exactly match the name. Now, since we are making a change inside the controller, we will actually have to restart our application to see this change. If we were working with the view, we did not have to restart. Let's go to our category and try to create a category with the same name and display order. This time you can see we have our custom validation that is being displayed in the summary. Now if we did not have summary, then this would not have been displayed. But what if you want to display the error message inside name as well? It is pretty simple. We will stop the application and the key, we will just change that to name. Because inside the category object, if you notice, we have name. So inside controller, we are adding a new error inside the name property. Let's run this and give that a try. Let's go to our category and try to create a new category with the same name and display order. Great, now you see it displays in both the places. So with this, we have seen how to add custom error message. But all of the validations that we have so far are done on the server side. Every time you hit the create button, you will see the page will reload. So that means we are hitting server every time. Even if the name and display order are empty, we go back and hit the server because the page reloads. What if we want to make all of these validations on client side? Let's do that in the next video. Now if you want to do the basic model validations like name and value for the display order on the client side, it is pretty simple. If you examine inside the shared folder, we have a validation scripts partial 
that is using jQuery.validate. It is inside a partial view. So if we want to do client-side validations, we just have to include this partial view in our view. So that brings the big question, how do we use a partial view? We have not created one, but we are using the one that is already available. It's not a rule, but typically it's good to name partial views with underscore. So even if in future when we create a partial view, we will follow that convention. Now in order to include a partial view, it is pretty simple. You can directly say partial and then you have to write name of the view. So make sure to type the exact name. If you have a spelling mistake there, then this won't be included. With that, the errors go away. But inside the partial view, if you open up, we have script files. So we need to add that inside a script section of our view. So here we will have to create a section for scripts. And in there, we will have to add our partial view and that too inside Razor Syntax. Once you add this, let's run the application one more time and see the magic. Let's go to our category and let's try to create a new category. We will hit the create button. You see, we get the validations, but we are not going to server this time. All the validations are done on client side because of the script that we included. To double check, you can just add a debugging point here and hit the create button. It will never reach our debugging point. It will reach our debugging point if the name and display order are the same, then the client side validations are valid. The validation that fails is the server side custom validation that we added. And if you continue, perfect. You can see that in action. So with this, we can see how easy it was to add client-side validation. Let's continue in the next video. Now that we have added the client-side validations, I want to show you one more thing. Right now, we have the default message that is being displayed. Right now, we have the default message that is being displayed. On top of that, you can see right now in display order, there is no space that is available and it is the same with the validation. The reason behind this is if we go to our category model, you can see that's the property name and that is exactly what is being displayed. So if we want to display something that is not the same as property name, we have display name here, which is inside component model. And here we can just give whatever name we want to display. So let's add a space there and it will correct that automatically. Let's run this and give that a try. Let's go to our category, create category. And this time you see in edits, we have a space, labels, we have a space and perfect. Looks good. Now, if you go on the official documentation, there are quite a few data annotations that you can use. We see the required one that we saw. We also have a range attribute. I won't go into all of them. You can explore them when you want. You can see the display attribute that we used. Now let's just try one more, which is the range attribute. That specifies a range for a field. So let me just close this and we'll stop the application. Inside our display order, we will add a range attribute. And here we have minimum and maximum value. So let's say minimum is one, maximum is 100. So now if the display order is not in the range, it will give an error message. But the error messages that we see on the screen with validations are also customizable. So with range, if we want some other error message, we have that property right here and we can give a custom error message. We will have our custom error message as display order must be between 1 and 100 only with two exclamation. Let's run our application and see that in action. Let's hit create. We have our required one. Let me add something more than 100 and you can see it directly displays our custom validation. With that, you can see everything is working as expected 
and we saw how to add custom error messages, a range validation, and how to use display name. Now inside our create view, I will hide or comment the validation summary because we don't want that right now. The inline validations are sufficient. Let me go back and remove the debugging point. Everything looks good so far. From the next video, we want to work on editing and deleting our category. Now that we have the create functionality working as expected, let's work on the edit functionality. For edit, we will go to category controller and just like we have the create get and create post, we will copy that and paste it one more time. This time we will call them for edit. So let me change the action method names here. One thing that will be different for edit is when the page is loaded, it will display the existing functionality of the category that was selected. Here we will retrieve an integer which will be ID. Based on that ID, we have to retrieve the category details and display them. So we can check here if ID is null or if ID is equal to zero. In those cases, we will return back not found because that is an invalid ID. If that is not the case, we will retrieve the category from database, so category from db, and we will extract that using our underscore db dot categories. Now this will retrieve complete list of all the tables. So on that, we have few more ways of finding one of the entity. First is single or default, which returns only one element every time. It will throw an exception if there is more than one element. ID is a primary key, so there is no chance that there will be more than one element. Similarly, we have single. The difference between single and single or default is single will throw an exception if no elements are found for that ID, but single or default will just return empty if there are no elements. So default will not throw exception if the element is not found. Similar to single or default, we also have first and first or default. The difference between single or default and first or default is that single or default will throw an exception if there are more than one elements. First or default will not throw an exception, it will return the first element of the list. So if more than one elements are found, first or default will return one element, single or default will throw an exception. Last but not the least, we have one method which is find. Find basically tries to find that based on the primary key of the table. We know that id is the primary key, so we can use find here and pass the id. It will find the category based on that id and assign that to our variable. Let me also show you how you can use first or default. With find, you just had to pass the id. With first or default, you have to pass an expression here where we will have a generic object. Let's call that u and we will say u goes to u.id should be equal to the id that we have. If that matches in any of the category row, retrieve that and give me the first one out of them. Let me copy this and paste it one more time for single or default. The syntax will be same. We will just use single or default and let me call this variable single. So these are three ways to retrieve a category from database based on the ID. I will comment two of them out, but I wanted to show you how that could be done using Entity Framework Core. Now, once we retrieve the object, we will check here if category from DB, if that is null, that means again, we will return not found. If we find that category, we will return that category to the view. So next, what we will do is we will create this view, which will have the category loaded, and we just need to display that. That view will look exactly same as the create view, but the only thing different will be that it will be for edit page. So we can copy the view that we have for create inside category folder and paste that one more time. I can rename this to edit to give us a head start. Let's open that edit view. 
our model will be the category model but rather than create category this will be edit category now when we edit a category we want the validations so that will stay the same the button text we will change that from create to update and it is just submitting back we do not have which action method it should submit to if you do not provide any name here it will by default submit to the same action that is of the name of the get so since the get is from edit it will post that to the same action method which is edit but if you want to be explicit about the action you can use that with the tag helper asp action and you can write edit like that so if you want you can be explicit but that is not required the back to list will stay the same so with that in place if we want to see this in action let's go to the index view of category where we are displaying everything i want to add a link to navigate to the edit action method there will be three columns here let me add another dx tag and inside the td we will have one with the links so inside this td we can add a div with a class of width 75 and btn group we can also give that a role of group in there let me add an anchor tag and we will use tag helpers inside this anchor tag this will be for edit and if we go back and if we open up the bootstrap icon let's try to find an icon for edit we have this pencil square let me copy that and paste that here let's run the application and we will get back to the index in just a second while the application loads let's get back here so this edit should take us to category controller and edit action method so if we go back here we want the asp controller it has to go to the category controller asp action it should go to the edit action that is great but if we go take a look at our controller action method it also expects an id so we have to pass that id with our link we can pass custom variables here so we can say asp route and then what is the name of the variable that is id right here so we will just say id here this we will have to bind with our object so we'll say at we have obj dot id you can see how dynamic we can get with the razor pages with that let's go back and refresh go to category we should see the edit button yep that is here you can see if you hover on edit you can see the url where the id is changing if you click edit here it will take us to edit category and it automatically populates the name and display order our back to list is also working as expected to make this button look pretty we can just add two css classes btn btn primary and some margin let's go back and refresh and this looks much better so our edit get action method is working as expected in the next video, let's work on updating our category. Now we are able to load the category that we want to edit. When the user hits the update button, it will go to category controller. We have the post action method for edit. You can have the same validation that we had there, but if all the validations are valid, we do not want to call the add, we want to call the update method on our categories db set this is a built-in method with ef core where based on the primary key it will automatically update all of the properties and you do not have to do any manual update it will take a look at the obj right here and it will find its primary key retrieve that from the database it will check all the other properties where the values have changed and it will update all of those so you can see it is handling all the complexity and we just need an update statement to update any of the category based on the id after that make sure that you are saving the changes and we are redirecting back to the index action 
If you examine here, you can see all the options that are available with RDP set. We have add, remove, add async, add range that will add multiple objects at the same time. We have update and much more. For this time, we will select update and we will have to restart the application since we made some changes to the controller. Let's go to our category and let's try to edit any of the category. And great, you can see update is working successfully. Now the last part that I want you guys to implement yourself is to add a button or a link here to delete any of the category. Once you do that, it should take you to a details page like edit category, but this will say delete category and the fields will be disabled. Then there will be a button to delete and when you click that on the post, it will delete the category and take you back to the index page. It is exactly same as what we did with edit category, but rather than update, you will have to find what keyword to use to delete the category. Also, I want to show you that inside edit, our validations are working. If you hit update here, you can see it does not let you update. You go back, the data stays the same. So all the validations are working as expected. But in the delete category, we will not need any validations because you have to make sure that the fields are disabled. So good luck with the assignment and I'll show you how to do that in the next video. The last functionality we want to work on is the delete functionality inside category. So we will copy edit as is and we will paste that one more time, both get and post. I will change this to delete and we will use the same name right here for the post action method. When we are deleting a category, we want to retrieve that category and we want to display that on the view. So this functionality stays the same with the get action method. Now with the post action method, you can either post the complete object or you can just pass the ID here. So we will have integer ID and based on that ID, we will first retrieve that category. Now I do not need any model state validations, so I will remove them. All I have to do is based on the ID, I have to retrieve the category. So I'll say variable obj is equal to underscore db dot categories dot find. Based on the ID, we will find that. If that is null, we will return not found. Else on categories, we have remove and we will remove the object, save the changes, redirect back to the index page. That looks perfect. But we see an error with the name. We cannot have same signature with the name and the parameters for two action method. So for now, let me rename this to delete post. Let's work on adding the delete view. It will be same as edit because we will be displaying them. So let me copy edit, paste it one more time. I will rename this as delete. Let me close all the other views so that we don't confuse ourselves. This will be delete category and the button let me make it danger since we are deleting. We do not want any validations and the fields will be disabled. So let me copy that as well. Now the post action name is added, but we have renamed the post method to delete post. So we will copy that and paste that right here. Let's run our application and give this a try. Let me go back and add a debugging point right here. Let's go to our category and we forgot to add the delete button inside the index view. I will copy this and paste it one more time. This will be for delete rather than square. We will have to look for delete icon. So let me look for a trash can. The get action will be delete. So we will use that. Let's go back and refresh. We have edit and delete. Let me give it a different color and perfect. Now, if you try to hit the delete button, it will take you to the delete category. Let's see what happens when we hit delete button. 
it will hit our breakpoint and you examine the ID is null. Now why is this ID null? It was not null when we were editing, but in delete this is null. The reason behind that is inside delete. Let me hit continue here and it will take us to not found page. That's perfect. But the reason behind that is inside delete, all of the fields for our model is disabled. If one of them was enabled, ID is primary key. That's why it was automatically being set on the form. So in this case, what we will do is we will have an input field with the tag helper ASP4 ID. That's the only field we care about and we will keep it hidden. Since it is inside the form, when the form is posted, we will retrieve that ID right here. Let's go back and let me refresh. Let's hit the delete button. This time the ID is populated. So now if you hit continue, now if you are editing, you make some change, you get this error message, but I believe with Visual Studio 2022, they are just giving that right now and it will be fixed later on. In that case, just rerun the application. So let's go to category here and try delete one more time. Perfect, that category was deleted. With that, delete is working as expected, but I want to show you one last thing. Right now inside delete, we have the action as delete post. What if we want it to be delete? In this case, it won't work because the controller will know that the action method name here is delete post for post. So if you want to explicitly give that a different name, we have action name attribute right here and we can give it delete. That way the controller will know that if a request comes in for delete action method HTTP post inside the category controller, that is this particular action method. So let me run that and show you that this also works. So let's go to category and delete one more category. Perfect. So with that, all the functionality are working as expected. I want to display some alerts when someone deletes, edits, or create a category on the category index view. How will we do that? For that, we have something called as temp data in .NET Core. Temp data has been provided with one single purpose. Whatever we want to store in temp data stays there for only one request. After that, if you refresh the same page, that will be gone. So that is perfect for displaying alerts of successful or failure notification. Let's take a look at how will we do that. Let's say right now that when we create or edit or delete anything, we will add something to a temp data of success. So once the create is successful here, before we redirect, we want to use temp data. It is directly available as you can see. So temp data and then you have to give any key inside there. So let me call this temp data of success and we will store a message there that category created successfully on create post. If they are editing, let me store category updated successfully in delete. I will say category deleted successfully. So we are storing some string inside temp data with the key of success. Now where do we want to extract this? We want to extract that inside the index view. So at the top here, we can check if temp data of success is not null. The main important thing is the key name must exact match. If you use a different key name, this will not work. So if this does match inside an h2 tag, let me display temp data and the value inside that. Let's save this and run our application to see what happens. With that change, let me try to create a new category. Great, you can see we have category created successfully. Now, since this is in temp data, if you refresh, this will go away. So it only stays in memory for just one redirect. And after that, it goes away. If we try to edit any of the category, 
we get the error of course we see category updated successfully when we delete we get the deleted successfully if you refresh that goes away so this is great when you have to display notifications on some of the actions that are performed now this temp data can be used throughout the application and not just one page so why not when we are checking this temp data success and displaying that do that at a global level so we do not have to add this in all the pages for that partial views will be a perfect candidate we can have some code inside the partial view and we can call that partial view everywhere we want because right now it is four lines of code but it is possible that this code will increase drastically when you do something fancy for notification so let's move this code inside a partial view and see how we can call that now that we have added a code to display some of the alerts and notification we want to make sure that this code is applicable on almost all the pages because if in future we add more pages we don't want to copy and paste the same code in all the places so the best thing is inside the shared folder we will create the partial views that is the folder that i like to place all of my partial views we will stop the application right click add view we will go with the razor view not the empty one and here we will select create as a partial view we did not do that earlier but now we will do that that will create an empty partial view i forgot to give that a name so i'll have to rename this once it is created it's just view we will change that to underscore notification what we want to do is the temp data check that we have here let me copy and paste that here and it will do its check since we have a temp data for success we can also implement a temp data for error so we can display both success and error notifications so great now inside index we can just say partial here and we can say name is equal to underscore notification pretty clean right let's say in future you want to add this to multiple pages you just have to add this partial tag and that will be done let's run our application and see if our partial view is working as expected let's try to create a new category and great that is working if we refresh that goes away so with that our partial views are working as expected Rather than displaying a text as an alert why don't we use something fancy like toaster so we have toaster.js so with toaster if we go to that github page we have a javascript notification that we can use if you go to demo here and hit show toast these notifications are much cleaner and easier to read in order to use that we will copy the minified js and css files let's add that to our project in the underscore layout now the css file we will be adding right here so we'll say link rel is equal to style sheet and the href let's go back and copy just the css so we will copy this and paste it right here now the js file will be required at the underscore notification level so we will have to go back copy the js file and we need to include that right here so we will have to use a script here src let's paste that also when we are using toaster we will need the jquery reference that is inside lib we have the jquery dist jquery.min.js so we will have to add both of them in both the places next we need the toaster alert so if we go back we should have a usage right here we have toaster.warning toaster.success we will use it exactly like this 
So if we go back here, if we have success that is populated, we need a JavaScript code. So we'll add a script tag. We will say type is equal to text forward slash JavaScript. And I will use toaster.success and display everything inside temp data of success. Make sure here you are using the single quotes and then you need the at the rate sign for accessing the C sharp variable. Let's copy the script tag and paste that for error. And this looks great. So with that, we have added toaster.js in our website. If we go back, even while the application is running, these are just the JavaScript changes. So you can refresh the page here and let's try to edit something in the category. And great, we see our toaster alerts here and everything is working as expected. Now let's say this notification is something you will have across all the pages. In that case, it does not make sense to add this one line in all the pages. Even though it's just one line, it just doesn't make sense. So rather than adding this in all the pages, you can add that in underscore layout and that will be included in all the pages. So just before render body, where we have all the body that we render for the page, we will paste our partial view and that will make sure that it is included in all the pages of your application. So make sure that you include only things that are needed across all the pages because this will be loaded every time your page loads. So with that, if we go back and refresh and try to delete a category, our toaster alerts are working as expected. Now that our application is up and running and everything looks good, I want to show you one thing with the controller. We added the controller ourselves and we also created all the views. But with .NET Core, we have some help if you want. So if we try to add a controller, this time we will implement the same logic, but with MVC controller with views using entity framework. We will hit add here, and this will create an MVC controller with views using entity framework on a model. So we will select our model category on that we want the CRUD operations. Let's select a data context that will be used to access the database and we will give our controller a name. I will leave the default name, but rather than categories, I will say categories temp controller since I want to delete that later on. Let's add this and see what happens. This will scaffold everything for us. It will create a new category stem controller and it will create the views for create, edit, delete, details, and index. You can see the new controller. It has all the action methods as well as the post action methods. And inside the category stem, it has added five views. Let's run the application and see the change. In order to navigate there, we will have to manually type category stem. It takes us to the view here where we have the index view. It displays our category. We can create a new category here. With this, it also asks us to input the created date time. Let's do that. You can see it is not as efficient because it does not know that created date time will be the default one. So it asks the user to input that, but you can create that, edit that, go back, view the details, and you can also delete any of the request. So all the CRUD functionalities with the views are ready for you and generated in just a minute. But you'll have to spend time on customizing this based on your requirement. The reason I did not want to go into this directly is I wanted you to spend some time and learn how to do everything from scratch. But once you know this, you can take a look at the controller action method. Most of the code will be the same. But that is also an option that is available. With that, 
Let me remove the temp controller that we added as well as the views. With that, our application is complete. Let's see how we can deploy this to Azure and see everything live on the internet. Now the final task is to deploy our application to Azure. So for that, you will have to create an account on portal.azure.com. I already have an account. If you are signing up for the first time, you will get $200 of free credit that you can use. The first thing that we have to do in here is we need to create a SQL Server and a database inside there. So we can create or search for SQL databases and let's hit the Add button. Usually I like creating everything from Visual Studio, but SQL Server I like to create here. That way I can easily see all the configuration. You will select the subscription that you have and in there we can create a resource group. I will call this resource group as .NET Mastery underscore course. And then let's enter a database name. We will call that .NET Mastery underscore DB. We do not have a server, so let's create a server. The server name will be unique, so I will use .NET Mastery server. And then we need an admin login. We cannot use admin here, that won't work. So I will just use admin SQL. For password, you can use something secure, select your location and hit OK. Now next option is to we want to use Elastic Pool. We will say no there and in the server location that's not available. So let me select some other location, East US 2 and let's hit OK. Then you need to select the compute plus storage we will select configure database there and I will use the lowest option which is basic here and that is 5 USD per month. Let's apply. I do not want to pay more for the subscription so I'm going with the lowest option. The redundancy backup that is perfectly fine with me. Let me hit review plus create. We will hit create here and it will take a while to configure our database and set everything up. And perfect, our database has been created. If we click go to resource, it will take us to SQL database. Now one thing that you will have to do is if you want to access this database from your local SQL server, you will have to select the set firewall settings and add your client IP. That will enable your client IP and you can access the database from SQL Server. Let's hit the save button to add your client IP there. Once that is done, let's go back to SQL Server and we need to connect to that server. So we will hit OK here, go back to the resource and we have connection string. Let me copy the server name here, go back and paste it and we will use SQL Server authentication. We have admin SQL and the password, let's press connect. Great, we are able to connect to our SQL Server. So with that in place, let's continue from the next video. Let me close the other tabs here. Now we are able to connect to our database from SQL Server. Let's go back to our project and we want to deploy our website to Azure. For that, we will right click on the project and hit publish. We will do all the setup directly from Visual Studio to create an app service and we will use the database that we created. Here we will select Azure, hit the next button. We will be using Azure App Service for Windows. If you are not signed in, make sure to sign in with the same account that you have used to create the database on Azure portal. You will select the subscription name here and we don't have any app service that are running. So we will create a new app service here and we need to give a meaningful name. I will call this Bulky Book Web and because of that the final site name will be bulkybookweb.azurewebsites.net. We will have our subscription resource group. If you do not have one, you can just create one. 
It is just any name that you want that is more like a folder structure in which you can organize everything together. Next is the hosting plan. By default, there is S1 hosting plan. I want to use the free hosting plan, so we will select new here and we will select the free plan that is available with Azure. Let me hit OK here and hit the create button. This will take a few minutes, but it will create and configure your app service. Once the app service is created, we will have to configure the connection string and then in the new database that is created, we need to make sure that migrations are executed. Perfect, this is done. Let's hit finish here. Then inside dependencies, you see we have SQL Server database. You can either configure this here, or if you just click the edit button here, it will display the database, which has a connection string. If you go back to your portal, and we will have to go to our SQL database, we have the connection string right here. We will copy this and we will paste that here. We just need to make sure a few things. We just need to make sure that password is populated. Let me do that here. User ID looks good. We will say that we want to use this connection string at runtime. Let me copy this and inside the entity framework migrations, we want to apply migrations on publish. We will paste the connection string here as well. Let me go here to make sure password and user ID looks good. And the last option is since we are using .NET 6, it is not available inside the API service. So for that, we will have to change the mode to self-contained. That will have a self-contained environment with .NET 6. With that, let me save this and let's publish. When it will try to run the migration in the logs, we will see one error with the IP address. Let's wait for that. And you can see it is failing here, so it should give us the error message pretty soon. And perfect, we see that here, it should be with the IP address. And there you go. You can see it cannot access this IP address. That is the server IP. So let me copy that and I will paste that in a notepad. Let me copy this IP address. We will go back and inside our database, we will set the server firewall, add that IP address, and we will save that. Perfect. Now that should not be an issue. Let's hit publish one more time. This time it should be able to push all the migrations and deploy our code to Azure. Once everything is done, it will load the website, which is bulkybook.azurewebsites.net. Great, it automatically opened up and perfect. This looks great. If we go to category, there won't be any category but we can create a new category here. And our alerts are also working. So perfect. With this, we have seen how we can deploy our website to Azure. That being said, this is only for testing, but the SQL database that we have, we are getting charged for that. So let me remove all the resources and we will also delete this profile. The reason I want to delete is I only wanted to show you how easy it is to deploy your code to Azure. So with that, let's go to all resources, select all of them, and let's delete them. So with that, we have seen the CRUD operations that we can do with category using MVC in .NET 6. So first of all, congratulations on completing the CRUD operations using .NET 6 MVC. We have seen quite a few things in this small course. But right now we are just getting started with .NET Core and there is a lot more to explore and learn when it comes to .NET Core. Even though this course has come to an end, I have advanced courses that will take you from the basics that you have learned here 
all the way to exploring new concept. Let me walk you through some of those concepts. In the full course of .NET Core MVC, we will take what we have built so far and convert that to an entire architecture because that is a real world scenario, because that is a scenario that is adopted with most complex project. Then we do not interact directly with the data context in our main project. We will be using a repository pattern and unit of work to interact with our database. So we will see dependency injection and how to inject that using a repository pattern. Then we will further split our project inside areas in .NET Core, which is a folder-like structure, but everything gets much more organized. We have seen temp data, but we will see view bag and view data with .NET Core and see how all of them are different. Next, we will use Suite Alerts, Rich Text Editor, Data Tables with .NET Core and API Calls. With any application, authentication and authorization plays a very important role. And .NET team has given us the Razor Glass Library, which is identity in the .NET world. That makes all of the authentication super simple because the basic functionality and table structure is already implemented for us. So we will see how to scaffold that identity in MVC application. Next with authorization, we will see how roles play an important role and how can we modify our application based on the role of the user that is logged in. In a real world scenario, we also accept payments. So I will show you how to accept payments using Stripe and also give refunds when the order is canceled. Session is one of the key feature that was very helpful with traditional MVC application. With .NET Core also, Session is not gone. We just need to do a little configuration and add Session to our project and we will see that in action. Most of the applications will send emails in some way. I will show you two approaches, one using the SMTP server and second using application SendGrid. Then with the modern applications, we have social logins like Facebook, Twitter and so on. So I will show you how the .NET team has made it easy to integrate social logins with the help of Facebook. Lastly, there are some advanced concepts like view component, how to seed database with DB initializer, and once the data is seeded in the database, our final goal is deploying the application to Azure. So you can see there are quite a few topics that we will cover in the advanced course, but with that you will get a solid foundation to build your real world project. And if you like this free course, please subscribe and like this video and I will have more free content uploaded every month. So good luck with your journey of .NET Core and happy coding.